Um, oh, here's here's a fun topic that we can talk about. How about like, what do y'all think about like childhood concentration camps? That's that's fun. That's light. It's actually kind of killed my mood for the show yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it really has. Yeah. Because yeah, I like. I was kind of in a good mood when I woke up this morning, and then I got on Twitter, and I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> like it really is horrible. Been been all I can think about. Yeah, it's day. hard to concentrate on anything else yeah. when. Uh, there, there was a audio clip of like the children crying, like uh, in a, you know, in their co- in their cages, uh, and then ICE agents like, yeah, this is our symphony or something like that. No, we, yeah, something something like that. It's yeah. like we got an orchestra. Yeah, here we, that's what he said. We got a, we have an, we have our own orchestra here. Um, Jesus yeah, H Christ! It, it's it's really bad. It's like. You know, they abolish ice people. It's like that's way too moderate. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, there was that one story about like the uh, his like brothers and like they they made him stop hugging like his like four year old brother because uh. like no no touching was allowed. Yeah, this is a <laughs> shitty country. I don't yeah. know if you guys knew knew that. That's that's um, deplorable. It's absolutely disgusting. The whole fucking country over there is just sickening at this point. It's not even it's not even at the point of being funny anymore. You know what I mean? It's really not. Like for a while you could kind of laugh at shit and look at Jeff Sessions and just think what a fucking goof tart elf and kind of laugh at it. It's like nothing. None of it's at all funny anymore. Yeah, definitely not. Like and but, like, I think Trump anno- announced he wants to set up space force or something. And I thought, you know, I should be able to laugh at that, but I can't anymore. It's just broken me. I can't laugh at any of that shit anymore. It it was pretty funny that one time he tweeted Kofifi. That was funny. <laughs> that was yeah. Of all, <laughs> oh god. Yep. No. Shit. Uh, Shit Capitalism is good, folks. Yep. It's the best. It's the best we can do. Yep. Thank you for listening to Book Club, um, the podcast. I'm your host this week. My name is Ansel. I'm Elijah. And I am Dylan. And uh, what we do here is we read a book on a bi-weekly, fortnightly type system, and we talk about it for an hour. Or so. Or so. So uh, in this week's book, we have... The Left Hand of Darkness, uh, it's by Ursula K. Le Guin. Actually, this is our second uh, Ursula K. Le Guin book we've read. It's the first uh, returning champion we've had on the show. First returning champion. Uh, I should say the late Ursula K. Le Guin, who passed away just a few months ago, uh, (laughs) earlier this year. Um, And it's the story of an envoy who is... Uh, a human, a human, human earth and uh, an earth human, <laughs> an earth human envoy goes to this alien world called Gethin, uh, also known as Winter. Uh, and on this world, it's basically the anti Dune. Did you guys notice that? It's like uh, Dune is your desert planet. This is like a complete ice planet. Uh, and, but there are, it's been settled by humans, but. These humans have evolved in such a way where there is no uh, gender. They reproduce uh, e- either, like when they when they reproduce, either partner can take on uh, male or female characteristics for the reproduction, and um, it's really that's the uh, the main obstacle for the human envoy. Um, 
who is trying to convince them to join the ecumen of known worlds to share culture, literature, trade, uh, etc. And uh, during this time, he's trying to convince the nations on Gethin slash Winter to join the ecumen. Uh, he has a hard time. He ends up, well, we'll talk about it. I'm sure he, it, it, he has some problems, and that's where the adventure comes in. So let's uh, start out just your overall impressions. Dylan, since you're sitting right here, hit me with the digits. Okay. I'll, um, I will say that it took me a while to get into it for, for this book to, to really grab me. Uh, but once it grabbed me, like it, it got interesting really quick. Like it was, it was slow to build, but I, I think it was necessary for that slow build because it was setting up this uh, alien world. Um, but yeah, once uh, once that ball got rolling, it, it was hard to stop. Uh, it was a very interesting sci-fi tale. Uh, I loved it. Nice, Elijah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to second Dylan on this one. Uh, I I also found it a bit of a slow roller, but yeah, when the hammer falls, it's it it's go time from then on out. And I found this one to be more of a page turner than the dispossessed. Actually, from beginning to end, I will say, um, I think the the planet building that she does in the beginning serves well throughout. And the the fact that it's really boiled down to the narratives of two characters with some, you know some other stuff interspersed that worked really well. I think the two main characters are clear and um, their views are clear, and it was very very interesting, very well done. Yeah, I'm I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to agree with both of you. I thought it was excellent. Um, it really grabbed me. I thought it was better than the dispossessed. I thought it was more of a page turner. Uh, lots of food for thought. I really love, like you said, Elijah, I like how it was written. It's sort of like cobbled together from recordings and folk tales mm-hmm. and the journals of the two main characters. So you got to see some of the same event from both characters' perspective. I just I thought the whole thing was mm-hmm. brilliant, and I loved it. Uh, I'm going to disagree with, with one thing you said there. I, I actually preferred The Dispossessed, uh, like just a little bit more. I like the way that its story kind of alternated between the the two worlds and it was like if i'm remembering correctly like they were kind of like passing each other in time was that right like one kind of started at like the end and one kind of started at the beginning and they were i don't think that was the case i think it just skipped around i think it was like a reservoir dogs type well no like it, it alternated chapters like one it was like his early years on uh, Eurus. Yeah, I think that's right. Or yeah. Anaris. Anaris was the the moon, right? Yeah. And Eurus was the planet, right? And so it was like Anaris, Eurus, Anaris, Eurus. Okay. Yeah, I think. And, you're right. and I like that that structure a little bit better. And I don't know. It, I mean, it, it's really picking hairs. Uh, this this book solidified in my mind that Ursula K. Le Guin is truly a master of language and uh, storytelling. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, first of all, like it's it's just by a nose that I, I prefer this to the dispossessed because the dispossessed was great, I thought. But like the reason I give this one the edge is because the whole the the whole purpose of the dispossessed is to produce the Ansible, which is in this book, and um, I don't know. It just had the kind of prequel. Like in hindsight, it had sort of like a prequel type unfolding i guess i don't i don't really know how how else to say it and what was the uh theory behind the ansible what's it called the theory of simultaneity yeah i think it was simultaneity yeah that's it i kept trying to think of how they phrased it but i couldn't i couldn't pick it up while i was reading simultaneity yeah and uh the other thing is like you said like so it, it, this solidifies Ursula K. Le Guin for you as a master of the medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thinking about this because, like, last fortnight, a fortnight ago, we did uh, Dune. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I said that, and I think you said this as well, Dylan. Uh, we 
preferred the dispossessed to Dune. And I thought about I've thought about that a lot since I said it. And I don't really think that's the case. I just think like Frank Herbert, you sort of get the sense like when you're reading it, you're like, oh, this must be where the mushrooms kicked in, you know? Like it's, <laughs> it's just so damn crazy at times. Um, and then, but Ursula K. Le Guin, she's just like, like her craft is on fleek, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, and Frank Herbert's is not. But I guess like, I don't know, I think like I got the sense like, Ursula K. Le Guin is like seeing a really great museum exhibit that's like well curated and very thought provoking and interesting and like sticks with you. And Frank Herbert is like riding a Willy Wonka's boat like while he starts singing. You know what I mean? It's like it's a completely different experience. And I think I actually I want to revise that opinion and say I probably like Dune better, but I think this is better in every way. If that makes sense. No, I, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Like I and I think both both this book and the dispossessed, I think they both both blow Dune out of the water. The in my mind, the only edge that uh, Frank Herbert has is in his world building, and um, even that, like he just by a nose, I think, because Ursula K. Le Guin's world building is is pretty pretty darn good. Um, the way she creates these uh, these cultures and these these societies that are wholly alien to us. And uh, yeah, it, she, she's she's the best. Um, Elijah, what, what's well, your take on this? Let me let me interject here. I think that what we're looking at, and I thought about this as well while reading the book, um, which I crammed today, the last half of the book. The um, I think we're looking at two different things here, though. If you're looking at a thoughtful novel that really makes you want to think and or you know i mean because this is a second Le Guin novel where she's tackled communist bureaucracy and this time pitched it against uh a monarchy if you're if you're looking for something that's completely wholly written and is unassailable from all angles you've got to go with Le Guin but i think frank herbert has the edge in producing an epic adventure sort of something that rides on the roller coaster emotions of you know revenge and 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 this grandiose sort of stuff fit for movies i don't think it's i don't think it's the same thing i think having them both thrown in as sci-fi authors is not fair i think it's i think it's two totally different styles and maybe i'm wrong about that you might be on to something there and that's a nice a nice cop out but it's allowed in this case because all right thank you i'll be i'll be here all week tip your server you know what i mean right like like reading dune it's it's more of a grandiose sort of epic thing it's a it's it's, a, it's more uh, unbelievable it's more unbelievable as one of it's more of a fantasy it's an ether frolic okay what is that it's when you're like i don't know i, I think it's pretty pretty well known that Herbs did old uh, some hallucinogens, right? That's pretty. I, that's, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't know that. I mean, it's not surprising, but I mean, like the both both of the things we've read from Le Guin are realism to me. It's sci-fi, but they're more believable. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, and um, there, that's actually something that I I thought about. Like, there are a couple of things. Two things that happened in this book that were like supernatural, and one of them was like the I can't remember what they're called. I took notes on this, but it, it's been a while. Uh, I've the foretellers, the foretellers, yeah. Uh, they could they they had like the special orgy where they could like tell the future. Like you could ask them a question and they could accurately predict or accurately answer your question. Um, and I was like, okay, this is supernatural stuff, and it kind of sours it for me a little bit but it was it was cool to have like it wasn't cool is not the word i need to expand my vocabulary a little bit (laughs) like it it was a good idea to have like for for the main character to know that his purpose would succeed like uh he he would successfully get them to join the acumen of no nations and that that sort of sets him up for being very brave and 
brazen with the wrong country, like the bureaucratic political. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how, how how to describe it. Orgrin, how would you say Orgrin? I, I think bureaucracy is is pretty uh, pretty on the nose. Like they were really really uh, anal about the getting the papers checked and right. Yeah, it seemed very much to me like a communist regime. Yeah, well, I don't I don't even think that really. It was just uh, sort of. Uh, I was thinking more like. A, don't want to i don't want to keep bringing star wars up into into our thing uh but it's more like the senate and by the senate i don't mean Palp- palpatine she palpatine i mean like the actual Sh- senate Sheev? yeah <laughs> uh it's treason then <laughs> but anyway um there was another thing with uh, another supernatural thing, but it didn't really sour it for me that much. I was fine with it, but yeah, um, I see what you're saying. Um, what what was the second supernatural I thing? Was remember. it the mind speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. The mind speak. That was that was uh, yeah. Uh, that that was like okay. This is this didn't have to be here, but okay, whatever, Ursula. This 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 is your world, and I'm just living in it. You know what I'm saying? So what, in my opinion. You have a great adventure tale set up by, like, a- after he goes to Orgarin, he's he sort of puts his cards on the table to the wrong people, and these people put him in basically a labor camp uh, in the almost uninhabitable parts of the world. Um, a-, a world that's already pretty pretty harsh to right. begin with. Yeah, and, and he's moved to the part that's barely habitable, and... He's going to die, but the um, Estravan, the guy who is his Gathinian minder, I guess? I don't really know how else to describe. Well, he was the the prime minister of... Um, Carhide, yeah. Carhide, the, yes. other, the other nation, the, the less bureaucratic nation. So, yes, yeah, so Estravan hightails it up to the labor camp, Busts him out, and they do like a impossible, what seems an impossibly hard trek across volcanic ice. It's, uh, it's basically like a three month long hike through Antarctica, right? Um, and yeah, it like seven hundred thirty miles. Yeah, and, and and towards the end of that section, it it, it kind of wore on me a little bit. Like uh, I, I think that section of the book kind of dragged on a little bit longer than it needed to, but I, I did enjoy it for for the most part. Yeah, I thought it was great. I didn't it didn't drag for me. Elijah, how did you feel about the ten thousand mile ultimate <laughs> ten thousand mile ice adventure? Um, I liked it. I thought it was well written. But I I want to I want to I wanna backtrack a little bit. The story of him getting to that labor camp was. An excruciatingly, um, how does one say this, painful thing to read. It was so reminiscent of some of the things you hear of the trains carrying the Jewish prisoners during the Holocaust. It was so well written. I think he's on the on a truck for like a week or two, and that was did that did that not get to you guys? It did. It, did. it, it specifically reminded me of uh, Slaughterhouse Five, the part where. Uh, Kurvana gets talking about being transported mm. to, to Dresden, and uh, like, mm-hmm. and it's kind of. I don't think it was as cold as it was in uh, in in this book, but like you know, pretty much the same thing. Talking about how, you know, people were pretty much dying standing up, um, like packed so tight in this train car that you know you can't really sit down or lie down or or anything like that. And it's yeah, the the fact that human beings are actually true that way is pretty pretty disgusting yeah i I actually didn't think of either of those things it reminded me most of like how uh how immigrants are treated right now like people seeking asylum i don't mean to laugh but it's like um yeah just illegal inhumane treatment of people happening Present day, 
in our country. Uh, that's that's what it reminded me of. So some escape this book was. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Maybe maybe I sh- maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. All right. So one thing I want to talk about, and like one one of the coolest. Uh, one of the coolest things that Ursula K. Le Guin did in this book, in my opinion, was the idea of like Shifgrathor. What do you guys think of Shifgrathor? Have you, have you heard about this Shifgrathor? Kevin, you heard about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like reputation. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know if I I grasped it a hundred percent. Like it was. Uh, I don't know. It, it was just like this weird, like social debt sort of thing, and I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't have the same same care for you, but I, I don't think I got it a hundred percent. I was kind of like the the envoy that didn't really understand. I didn't have any. I didn't give a shift, Grithor, about it. <laughs> I see what you did there, uh, Elijah. Yep. I think actually it uh it says some at some point towards the end of the book that Shifgrathor actually comes from the word for shadow, and I think it has a lot to do with someone's reputation, someone's uh it's saving face or not, is is what it boils down to. Okay, so here's my take on Shifgrathor, and this is why I like it. Uh, the idea is like without sort of a uh, with without gender and sort of gender roles and things like that. Uh, she invented this new thing called Shifgrathor, and it was intentionally hard to understand because we're Terrans just like the envoy, and like every description of it from Gathinians were completely inadequate because like how would you explain it to somebody like who how how would you explain it to the pervert who is one gender their whole life? You know, it's like and and I think like the the word for shadow. I mean, it's just such a a bad way to describe it. Something that should be obvious to the Terran, but it's you know he can't grasp it because that's that's not how his culture works. You know what I mean? I think it's cool. Like it was mm-hmm. intentionally vague and hard to follow, and I think it's supposed to be like that. It's like okay, it's impossible for us to understand. That's why I liked it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Good point. Good catch. And and another thing about about the uh I mean, I guess the main part of this book is like the genderless society. Was that food for thought for you guys? What did you think about that? Uh did you think it was necessary? Do you think it was a how do you think how do you think that played into the world of winter? Uh Elijah, why don't you go first? I found it immensely interesting and and I mean, right on the onset, I think he's using the pronoun he, and it comes up that, okay, I'm I'm using the word he because I have nothing here to throw in. And I thought I found that to be, okay, we're we're dealing with something here. And then you you find later that the envoy is actually thinking maybe this planet is a cruel experiment. But if you look at how I think later in the novel you come across the envoy when he's doing this long trek across the ice with the the um, former prime minister, the minister formerly known as Prime, he um, he won't let the prime minister see him cry. And there's this huge gulf of misunderstanding between why between them as to why. Did you? I mean, and and I think that it played so well on on. This person that they called the pervert because he is of one sex. I think it's worth mentioning that the um, the Winterans, what was the planet called? The Gathinians yeah. were herm- hermaphroditic, so to speak, but only once every 26 days. Is that correct? I think, I think that's they, right. They yeah. were in Kimmer every, like with their moon cycle or something like that. Yeah. Right, and so you have this—you have this difference where the human, the Terran human, 
uh, is constantly in heat, basically, is what the word kimmering is used for. And, yeah. and they see it, they, like, you can see their perspective of how does a society function when everybody's just DTF constantly, 24/7. when everyone's DTF 24 seven, how do you, how do you function? And then you get this also, which she did this also in the dispossessed, um, it, it mentions that there is no sexual frustration on this planet, that there's no, you know, uh, repressing of sexual feelings whatsoever. And I don't know. It's interesting. I, once again, I, I'm starting to believe that um, Ursula K. Le Guin, who just passed recently, was uh, d- deep down, she was a communist who was DTF. Uh, if that's fair to say there i didn't see <laughs> <laughs> i didn't see that that's where you're going uh with that but okay no i kid i kid i kid i kid it was a joke it's joke yeah okay um yeah i've got a i've got a few highlighted sections uh regarding this um but yeah the the main thing i took away from it is like it's like the way this uh Elijah, you kind of mentioned it being like a an experiment that some of the, like the I guess it would be the Hainish were the first. I, I I don't know a whole lot about the this universe, but um, it briefly mentions that you know the Terrans, the Earth Earthmen were a uh, um, like an experiment as well, and like it mentions a few other planets of where uh, this spacefaring civilization is kind of seeded planets with like some genetically altered humans, and and you know he kind of guesses that maybe the um the Gathinians were were as well. But the um this society is pretty pretty awesome and I'll, I'll just kinda read these uh these little selections I got here. The fact that everyone between seventeen and thirty five or so is liable to be, as Nim put it, tied down to childbearing implies that no one is quite so thoroughly tied down here as women elsewhere are likely to be, psychologically or physically. Burden and privilege are shared out pretty equally. Everybody has the same risk to run or choice to make. Therefore, nobody here is quite so free as a free bell anywhere else. And, uh, yeah, that it just seems like uh, this, uh, what, what would you call it, like ambisexual civilization i would say androgynous probably androgynous is what i would go with um it seems like it, it in, in theory it would make for a, a much more equal society i mean because you don't have these classic uh divisions but the, i'm sure that they they would find divisions elsewhere there are different nation states in this world oh and that's what shift growth were that's exactly what it was it was like uh rules for engagement rules of engagement for uh, members of the society, and it, it almost seemed kind of like, uh, uh, what was I thinking, like karma points on Reddit or something like that? Right. It's like, that's how you had, it was like your cultural cachet was shift or it had nothing to do with something that we could identify and recognize and quantify. It was its own thing. That So yeah, they they did have that. They did find a way. shift they, uh, I got a couple more quotes here, and, and this is the uh, the envoy um, kind of reflecting on the nature of this uh, androgynous society. Um, so here's another quote here from the book. Consider, a child has no psychosexual relationship to his mother and father. There is no myth of Oedipus on winter. I thought that was a good line, and, and just another example of uh, how this, this society might be somewhat superior to the one that we have. And then uh, one more here. Um, I don't know the context here. Oh, okay. So this isn't this isn't the uh, the envoy. I, I take that back. Um, making these statements, it's the uh, what was it that came before the envoy? Uh, like came and observed or something. The inspectors. Yeah, I think yeah. they were called inspectors. Was it? Yeah, I think so. So, so, so this is from from their their logs, uh, these past two quotes I've given, and then this one. And in the end, the dominant factor in Gathinian life is not sex or any other human thing; it is their environment, their cold world. Here, man has a crueler enemy even than himself. 
I am a woman of peaceful chef of war, which I'm guessing that's another planet in the acumen. Um, and no expert on the attractions of violence or the nature of war. Someone else will have to think this out. But I really don't see how anyone could put much stock in victory or glory after he had spent a winter on winter and seen the face of the ice. So yeah, it's I don't know it, that 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 whole chapter where it was just like a um, the observations of this uh, this inspector, um, basically uh, regarding the the androgynous um, nature of the humans on Gethenia, Get Gethen, Gethen, yeah, yeah, Gethenian. They, um, and yeah, it was just her kind of like reflecting on how that, uh, shaped their culture and their politics and everything. It, it, that whole chapter was just very interesting. And after I read that, I was like, man, it, it'd probably be kind of nice to have, uh, you know, be able to, to get rid of all the, um, sort of, I don't know the 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 fewer ways that we're divided as humans, the better. Here, here. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's the that's the goal of book club is to break down all those barriers. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I, I feel you. More quotes. Speaking of barriers, yeah. Can speaking of barriers, can we can we take a left turn right quick? Sure. Put on your, um, your left left hand blinker of darkness. That's right. Uh, well, you know, light is the left hand of darkness. And darkness, the right hand of light. Two or one, life and death. You know, lying together like lovers in Kimmer, like hands joined together, like like the end and the way. Um, so a few things have been going on, and I, and we've alluded at this earlier, and I think uh, in the in the earlier riffraff of the episode as well. We talked about uh, some of the things the United States government is doing currently, and uh, I think we're going to have a space force now. We're going to have like the space marines, and I think the United States is uh, what else? Oh yeah, we've pit, um, we've angered Canada for some reason. We're mad at Canada now. No, and, um, um, we're, we're uh, enforcing tariffs on uh, the, their goods and. Yeah, so some, yeah, some like uh, imagined trade, uh, trade deficit, trade that's, wars. That yeah, exist. their their unfair importation of syrup has just wrecked the American economy. Um, and and you know, oh, and Kim Jong Un did not like open up a trap door that led to the rancor, as I hoped. So. <laughs> There's just all this stuff going on, and there's a few passages in the book that really touch on blind ass patriotism. And uh, I think we probably have a few of the same I passages think... highlighted here. Let's get into it. Before, yeah. Before you do that, I just want to brag on myself for a second, though. Uh, mm -hmm. You know how you were saying like uh, light, uh, light is the left hand of darkness, and darkness the right hand of light. And uh, at one point, she like. Uh, Ginley I, the envoy, draws a picture of a yin yang and says, Do you guys know what this is? Do you have something like this? And I gave the dispossessed as my rating, I gave it a yin yang. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, boom, I correctly identified one of her major themes uh, from just, I don't know. It's like you. It's like you plucked it out of the ether. Yeah. No, no. It's, yeah. It's like. And, and. And used it to foreshadow the it's darkness. Like, it's like I got the Wheel of Fortune puzzle with just one letter turned. <laughs> so, so I'm bad, is what I'm saying. You're a, uh, you're a what's it called? A uh, wheel watcher? A truth seeker? A wheel watcher? No. A, a, for, a foreteller. <laughs> a foreteller? A wheel watcher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. That's I remember that. <laughs> oh. Uh, do you know what patriotism is? I don't think I do. If by patriotism you don't mean the love of one's homeland, for that I do know. The response is, no, I don't mean love. When I say patriotism, I mean fear. The fear of the other. And its expressions are political, not poetical. Hate, rivalry, aggression. It grows in us, that fear. It grows in us year by year. We followed our road too far. 
here, 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 here. And and as a, then as I later, said, let me stop you there. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. We we do have the same passage highlighted, and I, I took it a little bit a little bit further. Uh, you didn't take your okay. road far enough, in my opinion. Apparently uh, not. <laughs> it goes on. It says, "And you who come from a world that outgrew nations centuries ago, who hardly know what I'm talking about, who show us a new road." He broke off. After a while, he won, went on in control again, cool and polite. It's because of fear that I refuse to urge your cause with the king now, but not fear for myself, Mr. I. I'm not acting patriotically. There are, after all, other nations on Gethin. Um, but yeah, go go ahead and say what you're going to say. I, I I like that whole passage right there. Mm. Yes, very nice. I, I found it very um, correct, I guess is the way I would describe that passage. And then we come further on, uh, this is closer to the end of the novel where Jenry I is thinking about what patriotism is, uh, what the love of country truly consists of, how that yearning loyalty that had shaking my friend's voice arises, and how so real a love can become too often, so foolish and vile a bigotry. Where does it go wrong? Thank you, Miss Leguin. That was that was beautiful. Well done. Yeah, this book rips, guys. Yeah, um, while we're while we're on the same vein, I got I got another quote right here. We're we're eventually just gonna like just start reading this entire book to you, but uh, this is this is on the same vein. Um, let's see. I'm not gonna give any context. Um, how does one hate a country or love one? Tybe talks about it. I like the trick of it. I know people. I know towns, farms, hills, and rivers and rocks. I know how the sun at sunset in autumn falls on the side of a certain pl- plow land in the hills. But what is the sense of giving a boundary to all that? Of giving it a name and ceasing to love where the name ceases to apply? What is love of un- one's country? Is it hate of one's uncountry? Then it's not a good thing. Is it simply self love? That's a good thing, but one mustn't make a virtue of it, or a profession. Insofar as I love life, I love the hills of the domain of Esther, but that sort of love does not have a boundary line of hate, and beyond that I am ignorant, I hope. And that that's kind of like been my philosophy for, for years regarding patriotism. Like I, It's lines on a map that are, you know, drawn up by years of conflict and yeah it's it doesn't matter we're all we're all human yeah and and just to just to add to that if i may before we before we go any further how how much like kurt vonnegut does this does this sort of i don't know does this sort of writing ring to you to you too well i mean because i mean the whole the whole thing on patriotism is just reeks of vonnegut yeah, it's like I don't it's kinda like Kurt Vonnegut but with the funny bone taken out. Yeah. Like it's yeah. It doesn't have that sense of the absurd that, that Vonnegut has. But, but yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm getting at the meaning behind it. It's just it just feels like it's something he could have written. Right, right. I I, th- I think their their philosophies were probably uh at least, you know, if the not the yang type situation. No, no, no. I, I think it's like Ursula they, K. Le Guin and Kurt Vonnegut are one part of the yin yang. They're the yin, and then like uh, Anne Rand is the other. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, I, I was thinking more of like the friendship bracelet kind of thing, not the <laughs> not the like opposite, <laughs> like the uh, yin yang in that sense. It's like you put them together and they fit nicely, and they like. But no, I, I like the way you said it better. Like the okay. Um, there were pro- there there was some politics in this book. I like I like this book a lot. It had it had it all. It had friendship. The back of my book, uh, the I actually had a hard copy of this book. The back of it sort of suggests that maybe, just maybe, Ginley I and Estervan slash Hearth had a kind of love for one another as they were crossing that ice. Did you guys get that impression? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah, I think they 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 eventually 
I mean, to kind of frame this, like, um, Gidley I was pretty much the reason that um, uh, S. Raven was did not only lost his office of prime minister, but he was also exiled from his homeland. Uh, but it was it was because he was the only only person that really believed this this person from another planet was actually from another planet and actually wanted to bring Gethin into the the space age. That's true, and I think he also felt kind of responsible for for him in a way. Like he he was his guardian isn't the word, but the person to sort of protect him from the haters yeah and and just to, using that to kind of frame frame the situation where they're traveling across the ice i mean i i think if you go through an ordeal like that with any person um where like teamwork is makes the dream work teamwork makes the dream work but also like it's uh it's teamwork is necessary for survival i don't think you can go through a situation like that where you don't form a, a deep emotional bond with the other. I mean, like I, I don't even necessarily think that they're. Um. It was like a sexual love, like a romantic love. Well, he when he was in Kimmer, he was like, "Don't touch me." Yeah, whatever you do. So like, there could have been, could have been, but I, I think they were both. I don't know. I don't know. It, it didn't really discuss that much further than that. No. But uh, e- even so, like I, I think they, I, I think there was more of a brotherly love that they had, e- even to the point to where when Ginley I was speaking him, teaching him how to to mind speak. Yeah. Uh, S. Raven heard Ginley's voice in his head as his deceased as it, brother's exactly. voice. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that good catch uh he did miss his company when they got back to uh the fastness i believe it was one of the fastnesses mm-hmm. um also s s draven as you say i'm i'm thinking he 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 planned it he he had it all planned out he knew what he had to do it was almost like a uh more deep type situation where he knew what he had to do to accomplish his goal of bringing winter into the acumen of known worlds and also getting Ginley I out of there with his life. And I think he knew that the one way, one thing he had to do was to sacrifice himself at the border. Do you think he like, he did, do you think that was part of his plan or not? Cause it's kind of uh, ambiguous. Do you think he sacrificed himself for the greater good? Or do you think he was really trying to get back into Orgarin by crossing the border? Yeah, I, well, I mean, my I don't know for certain because it is very ambiguous, but I think some of the ambiguity is taken away by the fact that Ginley I tries to tell him to stop before he goes because it's almost like he sees what he's about to do. Well, see, like, I mean, at that point, though, he's he's pretty much darned if he does and darned if he doesn't because if he stays because they were on the uh, Carhide soil, and he was in exile. If he was discovered on on Carhide soil, he'd be executed. So, like his, I think his only hope of survival was to get to uh, Orgarin. Uh So, I, I I don't know if he like just willingly rode into his death, but I don't think he had any other choice. Yeah, I think he knew that that was going to happen, and he knew kind of had to do that to. Uh, also, maybe to clear his name too, because it even said like once they got there, he's like, "Oh yeah, by the way, his calculations for their food rations were his calculations were perfect." Mm-hmm. It's like it, it it like really seemed like okay, he was playing four D mind chess in their trip from Pulifin. Was that the name of the the penal colony? Something like that. Anyway, S- something like that across the ice, like. He knew exactly what he was doing and mission accomplished, but it came at, you know, he he gave he gave water to to the pervert. <laughs> <laughs> he gave red to the snow. Speaking, speaking of, which, of calculations, okay, go ahead. 
Do you guys want to know about when this takes place? I sure do. I did a little bit of a calculation. At one point, the envoy says they're discussing how people could learn to do the mind speaking. And he was saying, you know, that people can go for eons and not knowing they that they can do a certain thing. He said it was 3,000 years ago that Terrans uh, found the use of the number zero or the placeholder use of zero. So I kind of looked up. Um, that would be... That would be 350 common error uh, by the Aztecs. Or if you want to go back further to the Babylonians who used a symbol as a placeholder, that would be 300 before common era, 300 BCE. So you're looking at this taking place at 2700 common era if the Babylonians are the first to use the zero. Uh, and if you lean more toward the Aztec camp, that would place this in the year 3350. Okay, so it's coming up. Neato. Thereabouts, yeah. We're about 7,000 years away from uh, old Muad'Dib. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that made me think of a couple things. First of all, the... Um, oh, yeah, year zero. It's always year zero in Gethin. It's it's I like how they are so unlike us in every way. It's like instead of like well, I guess the main thing is like they they are in no no hurry ever. Like they plan everything out and like their vehicles only go twenty five miles per hour tops, which sounds lovely. I would love <laughs> if all vehicles only went twenty five miles per hour. There would be no traffic jams. Everyone would be nice and smooth. Yeah, and it's like and and they were like why why don't they go faster and the Gathinian re response would be why would you want to go faster and I, I like that it's year zero also you said we're how many years away from Wadi 1500 uh, about 7000 when is it like the 10 the year 10000 the year 10 well, he just said yeah, it was like 3500 what no that's for this book yeah i'm saying like this book is like 7000 years away from from what oh, I see. I, okay my bad. i see what you're saying but it made me think i thought it was cool how they said well what if what if we don't what if we don't agree to join the acumen of known worlds and ginley i dropping a little science on him said well it's okay i'll just come back in a couple generations and they're like how are you going to do that mr big stuff and he's like well uh the faster i go the slower time moves for me so it's a little relativity situation and I think relativity is super cool and super fun to think about. What do you guys think about relativity and how does it affect your lives? Well, I always, <laughs> whenever I'm like running late somewhere, I always drive as fast as possible trying to slow down the passage of time. Um, See, that's the thing. That wouldn't work because from the, from the perspective of the, of the place you're trying to get to, time would go normally so you would you wouldn't age as much and your your clock's car would say it was earlier in time but from their point of view mm. uh you would still be late does that make sense yeah it does so you're you're risking life and limb for nothing my but no. counterpoint whenever i do that and i drive insanely fast <laughs> in order to slow down time i always like end up getting to work on time so checkmate yeah physicists <laughs> Well, I was I would like tell my students like whenever uh, w back when I was a physics teacher, I would tell my students when I saw them like when I was teaching relativity, I would tell them you know I see you guys sitting waiting for the bus, and I'm in my car, and I'm like, you guys are aging faster than me. Relativity. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, shut up, Mr. Crowder. And I'm like, but seriously, the thing about relativity that I think is super cool, super fun to think about, is you can go. Let's say something's like a million light years away. You th you would think like if you could if you could travel almost the speed of light, you would think that it would take you over a million years to get there, right? But you could get there in like five seconds, and you wouldn't even have to go the speed of light. That's just like that's how time dilation works. When you go that fast, it slows down time so much that that million light year trip uh, could happen like that traveling less than and you could be traveling at less than the speed of light however when you 
try to contact home, first of all, the radio waves are going to take a million years to get there. Second of all, it doesn't matter because it's already, you know. A million years ago. It was post-history back then, even though it was like five seconds to you. I don't know. It's a lot of fun to think about relativity. Shout out to Albert. It is, it is. The the only the only gripe I've got with it is that my it makes my headlights useless. How so? You turn them on and there's nothing there. What are you talking about? If oh, you, you if, if you're dri- if you're driving at the speed of light, your headlights would not be able to project light in front of you. Okay. From all. From all every perspective, the speed of light is the same, 186,000 miles per second. It doesn't matter how fast you're going. That is constant no matter how fast you're going. Uh, another cool thing about relativity is that if you actually reach the speed of light, then you, you, you've warped time so much that everything has already happened. So this, the instant you go into light speed, the entire future of the universe happens. And like so, if you're traveling at the speed of light, there there is no such thing as time. Time is not a thing. It doesn't. It's 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 coitins, coitins for time. <laughs> Capiche? Anyway. And thus, my headlights are useless. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> took the long way around, but yes, your headlights. Are no, what is? No, all right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. No, but I mean, okay. But you, the source of the headlights is moving at the speed of light, and you turn them on. What happens? I've always wondered that. It's like one of those little mind exercises they give you in school. You're moving at the speed of light. You turn the headlights on. Can you see them in front of you? I don't know if there's a I, – I mean, first of all, I'm not a physicist. <laughs> this is just like just pure interest. I taught physics, but I was a math major, so I don't really know anything other than what I've – took the initiative to learn i don't think there's a theoretical framework to even talk about what would happen if you're moving at the speed of light because it's in it's impossible it's like saying well if i could if i could live underwater for eight years would i be able to build out of stucco it's like (laughs) you can't live you can't you can't live underwater dude you know what i'm saying it's like there's no it's like immediately impossible so you can't go you can't proceed from there that could be that's wrong. that's where we differ. I don't see anything as impossible. I think it is impossible to if if you're not born traveling the speed of light, then you can never travel the speed of light. I don't know. That's um, that's, that's not my area. Of relativity. Again, not a physicist. I don't really understand the rel- relativity equations, but I've watched some Vsauce videos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've got a few few more highlights here that I, I like to bang out real quick. Okay, if, if we're it. we're at a point here to to do that. Um, one thing about this book, there was a lot of I, I probably highlighted more in this book than I have in any other book we've done. Maybe like just dispossessed aside. Um, lots of lots of quotable bits. Um, and this, uh, th- this first one here, it's, um, uh, the character Fax, who is one of the foretellers, uh, a friend of Gimli. I know the show, Fax. Um, he says, uh, the unknown, said Fax's soft voice in the forest, the unforetold, the unproven, that is what life is based on. Ignorance is the ground of thought unproof is the ground of action if it were proven that there is no god there would be no religion no hendara no yomesh no hearth gods nothing but also if it were proven that there is a god there would be no religion tell me genry what is known what is sure predictable inevitable the one certain thing you know concerning your future and mine and genry replies that we shall die Yes, there's really only one question that can be answered, Genry, and we already know the answer. The only thing that makes life possible is permanent, intolerable uncertainty, not knowing what comes next. And this is, you know, this is one of the, uh, the, um, 
for foretellers, one of the the precogs of this universe, saying that you know the only thing that makes life possible is uncertainty, not not knowing what comes next. Uh, I, I I don't know. I just really like that passage. It just kind of gave some insight into the the philosophy of this really interesting cult of uh yeah you said you said it kind of turned you off the supernatural element of a it a little bit yeah but uh i don't know i found i found them very interesting but it, it had a purpose at least not not the mind talk it didn't really have a purpose i don't feel like except to well i don't i don't even know but the foretelling definitely had a purpose and it really drove the plot forward in a great way so no no deductions and what was it what was it uh, what was it that the foretellers would say that the the key was to know which questions to ask and not to ask them or something like that? Right. A um, couple more quick, uh, quicker uh, highlights here. Um, if civilization has an opposite, it is war. Of those two things, you have either one or the other, not both. I don't know. That was a cool. Um, this is kind of like a recurring theme in this book. Is like the. Yeah, you know, duality of nature, I guess, and um, the duality of civilization being war. Uh, I like that. Um, and what about like, civil war? Ooh, checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look and see if I can give any context for these and if it's needed. Um, here we go. He was after something sure, the sure, quick, and lasting way to make people into a nation. War. His ideas concerning it could not have been too precise, but they were quite sound. The only other means of mobilizing people rapidly and entirely is with a new religion. None was handy. You had baked due with war. And this is talking about the guy that uh, ultimately replaced e- Estravan. Who, uh, yeah, it was, um, no, he re- he replaced Argavin, Argavin, the king. Right. Who became pregnant in his 40s. Right. To the And there was this kind of a scandal because you're, he was past his his prime, his yeah. reproductive prime, ver- past the age of virility, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in addition to, like, these good philosophical nuggets, it was just a good story, I thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So it had it all. It was it was a great book. Maybe my favorite book club book we've done so far. Possibly. Definitely Ooh. of the ones I picked. I think it's my favorite. But I, I don't remember what all we've done so far. Let's see. That's a bold statement. What's What's been better than... I know you think The Road, Elijah. Uh, uh, Yeah, The Road's better. Dispossessed was better. Disagree. Uh, both of you. I think like this one had a road in it, Elijah. And it was just like... <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It, it did. Just, just it had like, several, uh, as a matter of fact. So this had everything. But they're not the road. Yeah, okay. Co- couple more highlights here. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, I believe, it's uh, Mr. I speaking of one of the Orgarin, uh politicians. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, Mr. Shuskis, I think. Uh, he says of him, he was a hard, shrewd, jovial politician whose acts of kindness served his interest and whose interest was himself. His type is pan-human. I had met him on Earth and on Hain and on Elul. I expect to meet him in Hell. Um, and that's just such a such a good way to describe that that Paul Ryan type of politician. Just that you know, jovial. His interests. His uh, acts of kindness served his interest and whose interest was himself. Dude, that's like the third or fourth quote that uh, I've also had marked, that you've had marked. So, theory, theory of simultaneity, right there. <laughs> we've, we've we, were, been... we were reading this book together through Mind Speak the entire time. Yeah. Uh, this is just, uh, some of these, are, it, I've done this before, just like clever uses of language. Um it is good to have an end to journey towards, but it is the journey that matters in the end. That mm-hmm. that tickled my 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 mind nuggets. <laughs> um, my <mind> nuggets. 
<laughs> okay, this is my last highlight. I suppose mm-hmm. the most important thing, the heaviest single factor in one's life, is whether one's born male or female. In most societies, it determines one's expectations, activities, outlooks, ethics, manners, almost everything. Vocabulary, semiotic usages, clothing, even food. Women women tend to eat less. It's extremely hard to separate the innate differences from the learned ones. And really, I, I could have just highlighted that, that last part. Um, it's extremely hard to separate the innate differences from the learned ones. Um, how much of, you know, what we know as male and female is, um, innate and how much of it is, you know, social constructs that have been perpetuated by society. And and, like, there is a line there. I I do believe there is a line there, but it's really hard to, to find that line sometimes. I would say impossible at this point. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know to to, to define. Yeah, sorry. Okay, well, here, all right. Here's the thing. Like, the way it works is like everybody has like an internal gender compass, like male or female, and that kind of like determines determines a lot about your personality. It's a, sort of a natural, you know, your determines like what your soul is like, I guess. Uh, and, um, which is different than your biological sex. So gender identity and sex are, are different. And for just about everybody, gender identity and sex are in alignment for some lucky people. They're not. Um, and so, I mean, that's the thing that I, I, and I think that about this book when I was reading and it, like this came out before sort of the main the the gay rights movement really kicked off and sort of became a mainstream idea or just like the idea of gay rights became mainstream not like they were making progress like i think the stonewall riots happened in 1969 and this was written a year nice. before <laughs> nice but um but i think like the the thing with gender in this book i think it was like maybe cause for uh, or maybe sort of a conversation, sort of like a cultural conversation starter at the time. But now, because there are like trans people and gender nonconforming people that are, you know, out and it, it's not as foreign a thing to most people now, I think it doesn't really have the the same thing. I mean, it's, like a, it's a little bit... Like, it's sort of like a shock factor there. Yeah, or it's sort of a, something to like, oh, I never really thought about that before. I think most people have kind of thought about this stuff by now. Right. Uh, And so, like, I think it's pretty well understood, except you except for some people. And, you know, this is the one thing I hate about Twitter is because these people are given a platform like homophobic, transphobic people are sort of uh, they have their signal boosted. But I think the the idea of like uh, or the fact that, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity, biological sex, all these things are like. You know, you can, they're all, there's so many different permutations of, you know, what can make a person from those three things. Um, and I think most people are aware of that and acknowledge it. So, yeah, I don't know if I even answer your question, but like how much of it is learned and how much of it you, is. You, you kind of did in a way, because cause like my question was, or more so like what I was highlighting there was like the, um, you know, separating the innate differences between um, the separating the innate and the learned differences between male and female. So, is what you're saying? It, it, it's more. It's not a binary like that. It's really not. No, it's it's uh, several spectrums overlapping, and yeah. But I think as far as like people can, I don't know. People can sort of pick up. You know, people can recognize cultural cues and sort of act accordingly, sort of against their natural inclination. So, I don't know. It's it's a little bit of both, but you know, the sort of the underlying uh, gender, sexual orientation, blah blah blah, is 
not definitely not learned. Is this may, did I did I? No, I, I I I just I I'm not saying that the gender is learned, but I I do believe that there are. Um, there are aspects to gender, gender norms that are, there are gender norms that are learned. Is that not, is that not correct? I mean, whether, whether they're, whether they're right or not, I think what Dylan's saying is that there are inherent characteristics that may be skewed by society. Oh yeah. That's a hundred. Absolutely true. Yeah. It's like the first thing as soon as you're born before you're even it, it even says it. it even says that in this book, like the you know the first question they ask when a yeah a yeah. person is born yeah it's like you know if you're a boy your room yeah. is blue if you're a girl your room is pink yeah uh, a bit yeah. early to be imposing roles don't you think but but yeah that's a hundred percent yeah you know yeah and boys and are given that, like uh, tanks and army figures and girls are given what easy bake ovens or whatever yeah it's right hundred percent yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at. Okay, I just misunderstood your question. So we can cut all that out. <laughs> <laughs> cut, 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 cut. No, no, no. Good discussion. Elijah, you guys. Got, Elijah, you got anything else? I know it's like 2.15 over there. Guys, yeah, I got a, I got a rating. Okay, let's, let's do the ratings. We ready for and, ratings? Yeah, let's do the ratings and then uh, call it a day, right? I'm glad you enjoyed the book. I haven't thought of my rating yet, so why don't you guys go ahead and give me your ratings, and then we'll wrap it up. Elijah, you said you had one already? Yeah, I've got one ready. Um, you're going to have to make an emoji for it, though, right? Yeah, I, c- I can probably manage that. that that's, that's your thing? I'm going to give uh, Ursula Kayla Gwynn's The Left Hand of Darkness four out of five Shifkrathors. Okay, I'm just going to use the Reddit karma point symbol, whatever that is. <laughs> four out of five. Four out of five. Okay. Four out of five. I'm 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 deducting one Shifkathor, um, because it's not Dune. No, just kidding. I loved it. It's a great book. Uh, I don't know how many Shifkathors one can have. I think having five Shifkathors is just not possible. It's an abomination. I don't think Shifkathor is set up that way. And I'm going to use that um, ambiguity to my advantage and just say four as an arbitrary as fuck number and let it ride. Okay. That is, uh, yeah. I loved it. Great book. I don't don't agree with you doing that, but I will fight to the death for your right to do that. Hell yeah. That's why I love you. That's why I love you. All right. Great book. Great book. Good All job. Right. Good call, Ansel. Awesome. Uh, four to five shift throwers. Dylan, what do you give it? All right. I give uh, The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin one Ziggy Stardust. One Ziggy Stardust. Okay. Mm. Because uh, Ziggy Stardust was kind of uh, androgynous and pansexual. Ooh, ooh. Elijah, do your uh, David Bowie, <laughs> ooh, you can do, oh, you know, you can do that. I can't do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so good. So, yeah. Uh, and it, it, it also. Ziggy played guitar. Ah. <laughs> ah. Very nice. So, yeah, yeah. It's, You're uh, welcome. I think David Bowie might have been a Gathinian all along. Ah. He'd come to us from uh mm. across the stars. Ah. But also Ziggy Stardust, he was uh like in space and he rocked, kinda like this book. So I that's my rating one one single Ziggy Stardust. Well Very um, good. Very good. I don't really have a rating for I should have thought about this. I don't know how I always forget this because <laughs> Like it was your idea to I do know. the ratings to start with, and we're too far we're too far invested in it to stop. But anyway, I'm gonna give it like a fire emoji because even though it like it was it happened on an ice world, it was still it was still lit. <laughs> yeah, this book was lit <laughs> like a fire is, is lit usually. So this book was fi. That's that's a word that the kids use. Fi. It's fi, short for fire, I guess. That's fi, bro. All right. That's it. Uh, four to five. Well, we, well, we, we all, everybody heard it. Everybody knows. Elijah, here's his conch. 
uh, tell us what Ooh. you want to read. Put this conch over here, out of the way of my tea. All right. Um, for the next book, you guys, I'm I'm gonna we got to get away from all this seriousness, okay? So leave it, leave it to uh, leave it to old Elijah to steer the HMS listener to uh, something a little more fun. We're gonna do the never ending story now. I've been told this, 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 epi- seen this, the film. <laughs> this episode might come out a little late, so just wait, be, be prepared. Wait, wait, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've been told that if you've seen the film, <laughs> that, that that it doesn't do it justice, that the book is completely way, way better. However, the never-ending story is written by a, na- a man named Michael Ende. Ende is German for end, and he wrote the never-ending story. And so we're going to do this as an exercise in irony, and also uh, this should give us a long break from podcasting. <laughs> this, I enjoy podcasting. I don't no. need a long break from podcasting. No, Th- this will be yeah, interesting. Just, this will be interesting because I, I, I've actually never seen the movie, so I'll, I'll be able to really You've never seen the movie. I've seen the end where he's like riding the dog, the flying dog. Like that's the only thing mm-hmm. I, re- I'm, I maybe I saw it when I was really little, and that's the only thing I remember. You don't remember the gate with eyes? Nope. With the laser eyes? Nope. Oh, dude, the Oracle that was awesome in the yeah. movie. You would have re- you would have remembered it if you'd seen it because okay. nobody could ever forget. Well, yeah, I, I must have just caught the end where he's like flying through the clouds on uh the the Skeksis. You are in for a treat, my brother. I'm looking forward to All it. All right, it's awesome. Um, All right. Are y'all gonna? Buy oh, here's this conch back, Ansel. <laughs> huh? Okay. Thanks in advance. I know I've I've received I I received a hard copy as a gift. That's the only reason I picked it. Okay. So we're gonna have to get out <laughs> on the street and find a copy of this book. Um, or you could watch the movie. I will allow in this one since I picked it. I will allow me to read the book and you or both of you to watch the movie instead oh, no, and I'm, we can do it that way i am reading that book i've read every book club book so far dylan's <laughs> never seen the movie so you can't you, all right you can't right. uh yeah no um all right. <laughs> thanks for listening Head on over to uh, bookclubcast.com. We got links to all of our medias, social and otherwise. Uh, make sure to go over to iTunes and give us a, give us a rating on iTunes. Uh, five stars would be fine. And then uh, in, in the actual text of the rating, you can give us uh, one Ziggy Stardust if that's what you give Book Club Cast. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, Listen next week, or sorry, two weeks from today. Two when weeks. We, when we uh, talk about the never ending story by Robert Enda. Is it Robert? Michael. Michael Enda. Roger and make sure you Enda. get the English version. Michael Enda, never ending story. Be there or don't. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it still rhymes. Actually, I do care. Be, be here. We want, yeah. All right. Then, Enda. Thank you.